Uh, welcome to uh, the session on harnessing uh, domain-specific languages. My name is Venkat Subramanyam. We're going to talk about DSLs, of course, and what are DSLs, why do we care to create them, how do we create them, and just to set your expectations, mostly in this talk, I'll be focusing on what are called embedded or internal DSLs, not so much about external DSLs, but hopefully you'll get information about what the distinction is and how to approach it if you do decide to go some, you know, some other route. Uh, the best time to ask a question or make a comment is when you have it, so don't wait until the very end. Uh, there's absolutely no question you can ask that would be considered as trivial or stupid. Uh, every question you have is genuine and important and interesting, and the chances are if you have a question that somebody else may have the question also, so certainly ask questions. Uh, and you're not limited to just asking questions. You may make comments. You may make observations. Just about anything. You know, so don't hesitate at all. Feel free to participate. This is a three-plus-hour session, right? So it's a long session. So as an as a incentive or a carrot for you to endure that three-and-a-half hours of the session only with, with a small coffee break, towards the very end of the session, I have a quiz for you. Uh, no, it's not a quiz, a really hard quiz, simple questions. But anybody who answers that question has a chance to win a copy of one of my books. So I've got two copies of my book here. And uh, of course, if many people have an answer, I'll select somebody in random. So you have a chance to win uh, one of these two, uh, two of these books towards the very end, uh, if you do decide to uh, you know, stay and uh, answer these questions. So without uh, further um, delay, let's get started. Um, so, what is a DSL? Why do we want to do that? And so on. We'll talk about all of that here. So, how do we communicate as human beings, right? So, so how do we communicate as human beings? We could say, well, we use words, certainly, right? But it's more than words that we use to communicate. Well, ah, please. Language. language, right? Words that make languages, languages that make words. I don't know which way it is. Sound. Sounds. Sounds. Uh, anything else? Yes. Yeah. So what, how, do, how else do we communicate? Ex somebody said expressions. What a beautiful, you know, if I'm talking to my wife, a lot of times I don't even have to talk to her. I look at her and I know this is very romantic, right? But sometimes I just look at it and smile, and we have communicated, right? Um, that's because we share a context, right? Um, somebody may say something, and maybe you and I were in a movie, right? And somebody says something that's very similar to what's in the movie. We don't have to use words. We hear that and say, that's funny. That's kind of the words in the movie, right? Guess what? We already communicated. So expressions, awesome, right? Expressions are a way to communicate as well. That was a very good answer. So you get a candy for that. Yeah. So, and somebody said language. Who said language? All right. I'm, okay, it's going to hit somebody when I throw it, but we'll try. Yeah, there you go. All right. Very, very good. So, let's look at this communication here, right? So, let's look at this. Engine stop. Engine at a deep end. Out control. Both auto. Engine engine command override off. Engine arm off. Can you hear me? Sorry. That's all I can do. Okay, well, it's okay if you didn't hear it, but here's what it said, something like this. Fortunately, that's why I put this in the writing. So you're saying, okay, we couldn't hear that, we couldn't read this now. Okay, I'll, I'll read this for you. So if you notice what's being said here, this is... Um, Aldrin and uh, Armstrong talking back to the ground control. Now, obviously, they are communicating, right? But they're not going to sit there and speak grammatical English. That's not going to happen, right? Because it's a moment of critical communication. You want to communicate, not talk, right? There's a difference between the two. So if you notice some of the things here, Look at what he is saying. 60 feet, down two and a half, two forward, two forward, that's good. 
goes on further, okay, engine stop, ACA, out of de uh, uh, detent, out of detent, auto. Anybody knows what that is? I don't have a clue, right? Why don't I have a clue? You say, well, did they land the spaceship in, on moon? Of course we know they landed, right? Absolutely they did that. So they did communicate between themselves. I don't understand anything. So tell me why I don't understand, but they were able to understand it fairly well. It's the context, right? There's a context, and there's also something else. They are educated, I'm not, right? They have education in that line of business. I don't, I'm not a, involved in space in any way, right? So a lot of things they do, I don't have a clue. I don't have the context. I don't have the education. I don't have the knowledge of their domain, right? But they understand these things. All these acronyms, all these things make a lot of sense for them. So that is basically what is needed in communication, right? It's the domain. It's the knowledge. It's the context. And then there is also the fluency. Right? They're extremely fluent. What's the beauty of being fluent is that you communicate very quickly. And you want to be getting things done very quickly, so there's fluency. That is all DSL is all about. Right? It's a domain where you have a good knowledge in that particular domain. You have a good context for the domain, and you're extremely fluent in communicating with the domain. Right? You guess what? You and I could sit in a room. We may have never met each other. But within five minutes, we'll be doing technical terms and jargons because you and I share something common, right? And that is our domain, our knowledge, our context. And so you and I can communicate very effectively. And the guys in the next table will say, these guys are crazy. I don't know what they're talking about, right? Because you and I share that context. They don't share the context. They don't have a clue what's going on in that case. So as human, we communicate using jargons. So what's a jargon? Special words are expressions that are used by a particular profession or group and are difficult for others to understand, right? And so we use jargons to communicate all the time, right? That's, the, that's what we do. And similarly, doctors use jargons, right? And astronauts use jargons and so on. Everybody involved use their own jargons. But aren't jargons bad? They're extremely bad. Right? Why? Because it leaves people wondering what's going on. You don't understand. You don't have a clue. So if you're going to talk to somebody who is outside of your field, you don't use jargons. Right? Because they, go, they have no clue what you're talking about. They feel confused. So then what do you do? You use more words. And you try to go to the level where you describe. And that's when we say describe in, in terms of the layman language. Right? Layman language is where they don't have the jargon. They don't have the context. They don't understand what's going on. But if I go to somebody who is a professional in my field, and I start speaking like that, they get irritated, right? Because I'm wasting their time, communicate very effectively. So jargons are very bad, and you're totally lost if you don't know the domain, don't have the knowledge, and you don't have the context. But they're extremely good, and it's very highly effective. And so there is a very high signal-to-noise ratio. The signal-to-noise ratio is something you cannot underestimate, right? There's a lot of signal, there's very little noise, you're communicated. But if somebody says a lot, but you never got anything out of it, there was more noise than signal in it, right? You want a high signal to noise ratio. So this is what professionals do in their respective fields. So how do you use your application or computer? You know, I was st stuck in an airport. And, when I, and I get stuck in an airport quite often because I travel a lot. And when I get stuck in an airport, I'll go to this agent. Within the first five seconds, I know whether I'm going to go home or not, right? If this agent goes for a mouse and clicks around, I know that I'm going to spend the night in the airport, right? And then sometimes this agent, you know, kind of sits there and opens up the command prompt, right, and goes brr at it. And it's like, yes, I'm going home tonight, right? Because this person doesn't sit there and use this interface given and attacks the underlying interface, right? And runs commands, queries, and says, well, we can get you out of here to over there and over there. You want to take that route. It's like, please, I want to get out of this airport. Any way you send me, I'm willing to take, right? And that's basically where, how do they communicate with this? So if you're really working with an application, you want the command of the application. And I'm not going to tell you that a graphical user interface is bad. That's not my intent. 
But a graphical user interface, a lot of times, takes the novice and makes them productive. But unfortunately, what it does is it takes the expert and makes them counterproductive, right? If you're dealing with the user interface, if you don't have a clue how to use this application, you can click, 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 and do it. But if you have used this application for a while, then you begin to hate it, right? I was mentioning this the other day. I used to love Microsoft Word until I started using it for something really serious. Right? Then I hated it, right? Because it's like, hey, wait a minute. How do I do this? Uh, no, you can't, right? Or you've got to click these seven things to do this. It becomes very counterproductive. So you want to be able to be productive all the way through. And so how do we directly communicate and you know, have these queries? That's very important. So productivity is the key, literally key as in the keyboard key as well, right, is the key. So you want to be able to be very productive in communicating with the application. Again, don't mistake that I'm not saying every user interface is wrong. There are certain applications where a UI may be really useful and productive, so we got to kind of you know, uh, look at it from an from a individual perspective. So there's this concept called naked objects. This is a, a, a research that came out of a couple of guys, uh, Richard and Robert, they introduced this concept of naked objects. What they did was they said, look, if you have information, if you have behavior, if you have these objects, why not expose these objects for user interaction? So the graphical user interface is not something you generate. It is something that gets generated. If you're interested in this more, not only take a look at naked objects, but I want you to take a look at yet another product as well. A good friend of uh, a friend uh, called uh, uh, Aton Zeus has done this. It's called J Matter, and J Matter is a pretty interesting tool. What J Matter does is it allows you to write classes as you normally do, and you're done. And what J Matter will do is it'll smell your classes and say, "Aha, these are your domain objects," and it'll generate the user interface for you. So you don't have to write the user interface; it does it for you, right? So if you're developing Internal applications, you can quickly build them with JMatter, and, and you, know, you can have the UI built on top of it by simply declaratively specifying things rather than sitting there and creating the UI, right? So take a look at uh, JMatter. JMatter is a, uh, so, so Aton basically generated JMatter based on uh, his uh, exposure to, uh, to naked objects, so certainly it's worthwhile. But the naked objects, I also have tools related to this. And one of those is the object-oriented user interface, as they call it. So it exposes the behavior of the domain objects for direct interaction uh, by the users. So that is the beauty of it. So what it basically says is, you want to be able to expose the real underlying power for the users to be able to interact with your application. That's the whole idea behind this. So if you are talking to a domain expert, how do they do matrix multiplication, right? They do it like this, right? Not at all, right? Nobody will stay sane after doing it that way, right? They get very angry if you give that to them, right? They say, what's this? You're calling these methods. doesn't make any sense for us to do. The way they're going to do this is like that. Well, that's what they use. That's their domain for communication, right? So they use the plus symbol and get their work done. And that is what they do. That's what they read. That's what they make sense. That's what they're going to use to communicate. So the goal of a DSL is to provide a highly effective interface for the users of your application to interact with your application. That is what your real intent is for a DSL. Again, it depends on who the user is. There could be a domain user. There could be an end user. There are people who are configuring your application and so on, and you want to be able to help with these. The interface may be graphical sometimes. The interface may be textual. All of them may be different ways to specify it and may include a DSL. You say, all right, all right, but, but, but. What in the world is a DSL, right? You keep saying this DSL thing, but what is a DSL? So let's talk about what a DSL is. So a DSL, of course, stands for domain-specific language. It's a language that is targeted at a very particular type of a problem. Because you're targeting it to a certain type of problem, you know, languages like C++, Java, C Sharp, fill in the blank with any other language you like, those are general purpose languages. These general purpose languages are used to write all kinds of code, but not so in the case of a DSL. A DSL is very specific to that small, narrow problem area. And what's the good news about it? Well, what happens is because it's specific to it, it is extremely narrow, small, and focused. And that is actually good. 
Because of the narrowness, it is very small, and at the same time, it's very simple. And both of those are very good characteristics because the people using it don't have to endure complexity. It's simple for them to use. It is also small vocabulary they have to learn. Yes, they cannot do all kinds of stuff with it, but guess what? You don't want them to do all kinds of stuff with it anyways, so it's very narrow and limiting, and that's a good thing to do, right? You want to, you want to provide the tool that's right for them and not over and not less. So this domain, what's this domain? Domain is an area or sphere of knowledge or influence or activity. A domain is something that's extremely important, right? All of us work in applications. The applications deal with a certain domain. We need to understand what the domain is. We need to be able to model that particular domain. There's a really good book out there by Eric Evans called Domain Driven Design. So take a look at it if you're interested. If you've not looked at it already. So a domain is very important. But within this domain, imagine this domain to be this wall. Well, guess what? It's a nice big wall, but I'm sorry that's too big for me to be concerned about it. So what I'm interested in this is this window up here, let's say. That's the context, right? So I'm not interested in the domain because a domain is way too broad, way too complex, and way too uninteresting to me a lot of times. If I'm only dealing with the domain, I'm going to be wasting my time and complicating the system. So the context is very important. So the context is this narrow window within this, on this huge wall. Now that gives me an area of focus. You know, when I deal with my customers, sometimes they would say all these nice things. Then you say, OK, that's nice to hear, but how is that related to this application? They'll say, well, actually not. I just thought that would be exciting to know, right? So you just need to weed out and say, OK, that's not interesting to us. But within this context, there is this bounded context. The bounded context further narrows our interest and says, let's focus in that narrow area, because that's what we're focusing on implementing in our application at this moment. So bounded context gives us the ability to focus on that narrow area, and that is something we need to be aware of when we create these domain-specific languages also. There's also another thing that Eric Evans talks about. He uses the term ubiquitous language. A ubiquitous language is a language that can be used by several people to communicate. Now, there's the symbol right here. It is not in English. It's not in any other language, but I'm sure everybody in this room understands what that is saying, right? That is an ubiquitous language, right? You know not to drive fast in that area because you're going to be hitting a moose, more so being hit by a moose, right? So it's basically warning you to a traffic hazard you ought to be you know, careful with. That's an example of a ubiquitous language. You are creating a ubiquitous language when you're creating a DSL. Why is that? Because that language can be used by programmers and domain experts and everybody involved to communicate. But of course, it is still very narrow because it's within the bounded context of this domain. So if somebody doesn't understand the domain, they won't understand it. But you may say, aha, my domain experts understand it. But how come, what about my programmers? I would say your programmers have no business in that application if they don't understand the domain, right? So you need to know the domain if you're going to program. If you don't know the domain, you're a type is not a programmer, right? So you need to understand the domain so you share the context and you build with them. So you need to take the time to learn the domain. You may not be an expert in the domain as much as they are, but you're not, you cannot afford to be ignorant in it as well. So the domain folks understand it fairly well. It's very highly expressive and easy to use as well at the same time. But where does this all fit in together? Where do we use it? You have most likely uh, used multiple languages to build your applications. My friend Neil Ford has a term for it. He calls it a polyglot programmer. A polyglot programmer is his vision for how programming is going to be done in the future. Uh, Google for polyglot programmer. You can read about his uh, you know, discussions about it. So he says, we are polyglot. You are already a polyglot programmer, he says, because you're using multiple languages. But this is what is going to happen in developing applications, is that you are going to use multiple different languages. Martin Fowler says that rather than using one big general purpose language to build your enterprise applications, you are going to use number of smaller languages to build your applications, right? So large scale enterprise applications are not going to be created using single large languages, but several small languages is what the claim he has. So again, this leads to this polyglot concept where we're going to be using multiple languages. Ola Bini argues in this blog that an application is going to have very interesting layers in the application. Here's what he talks about the layering. He says that you're going to have 
a very small but stable layer for your application. So that forms the basis of this pyramid. And what he talks about in this case is Java, but more so he's talking about the JVM at this level, right? JVM gives you this beautiful platform on which you can build applications. Guess what? It's an extremely stable platform, right? It's a platform that's extremely powerful as well. How many times do you run into bugs in the JVM, right? Not as many, right? It's pretty stable and very powerful. And then he says on top of that, you're going to have a dynamic language layer. And this is where you're going to use language like Groovy and JRuby and so on to build your application. And then on top of that, he says, you're going to have a highly expressive DSL tier, which is going to be very specific to your domain that you're interested in dealing with. And your application is going to be all these three layers built up is, is how you're going to build your enterprise applications. So again, you can see that at the top of this is the, is the DSL layer, which is the narrow area we're focusing on in this particular uh, session. What does it take to build a DSL? It takes objects, obviously, because using object programming, right? Then it takes metaprogramming. What's metaprogramming? Metaprogramming gives us the ability to alter the behavior of the application, the code, while it is running. And metaprogramming is like us, right? When we were born, we knew very little. But over the years, we have gotten smarter, right? Okay, most of us have gotten smarter since the time we born, right? We learn, acquire skills, we edu get educated, we get other things we learn along, and then using those, we kind of we grow and mature. That's kind of what you do in this program. The program starts up, and then it starts acquiring and assimilating these behavior along the way. You also need a lot of patience, because as you start developing these DSLs, you'll sit there and scratch your head. How do you make this work? Remember, the goal of DSL is not for you to get done and go home. The goal of DSL is to make it easier and expressive for the domain users. And I think it also takes a lot of coffee, right? The caffeine helps a great deal to stay there and be awake. So all these are important to build a DSL. So what are the types of DSLs? There are two types of DSLs out there. You can certainly encourage a third type, which may be a combination of these. I don't think that's impossible to have. Certainly, that may make sense. So there are external DSLs and internal DSLs, as Martin Fowler defines it. So what is the difference between an external DSL and an internal DSL? Where does that come in? An external DSL is something most of us have used one time or the other, maybe or may not be without knowing. So you define a new language. That's your language. You describe this language. Once you define this language, you then write parsers for it. You may have used Lex and Yak. You may use Antler and so on, and you build these parsers. You know, the first job I got out of school, it was a company where they were maintaining a huge keyword input file. And when they hired me, they said, hey, Venkat, your job is to maintain this DSL, the grammar. And I started working, and I realized I have to spend a lot of time and effort maintaining this Lex and Yak you know, uh, grammar. It was a lot of hard work. And I thought they wanted me to do that because I was good. Then you realize after a few months, the first job you get, they ask you to do things not because you're good, it's because nobody else wants to do it, right? <laughs> so of course, once I realized it, I was like, aha, uh -huh, I'll give this to the next guy we hire. <laughs> Guess what? I was the last one to get hired for the next three years. So you know who maintained the Flex and Yak parsers, right? It can be a lot of fun, as, as within fun. So it's a lot of pain. That's what it is, right? You have to sit there and maintain this Lex and Yak grammar and it takes a lot of effort. Similarly, you could do this in Antler, for example, and you can maintain it. The good news is you got the full control. The bad news is you got the full control, right? You got to do everything all by yourself, right? You have the pleasure, but comes with the, as the other side of the coin, the pain that you have to do everything all by yourself. So that is basically what an external DSL is, that a DSL is written, and you write and maintain something that can parse it. Now, of course, that, can, that could get translated to underlying APIs to other languages, other things, but that's all your work, and decide what to do with it. So that's what an external DSL is. Now, on the other hand, what you could also do is you could create these internal DSLs. Well, let's take a look at an example of an external DSL. You know, somebody pointed this to me, and I was like, of course, right? 
Cascading style sheets are an awesome example of an external DSL, right? You may have never thought about it that way, right? But what's a CSS? A, would you agree that a CSS is two source and you go eat that CSS string? It's like, what is the doing, right? I want to know what this Amazon website is doing, or Google is doing, and so on. You take a look at it. So a CSS is an example of an external DSL where it is specifying, basically in this particular example, you know, what happens when the mouse hovers over that particular uh, link. Now here's another example of an external DSL. This is the exa one example of a good old make file, right? So a lot of us may have used a make file, right? If you have written ever a program in C or C++, you sit there and do a make, and you then compile your code. It tells what kind of dependencies these files have, what to pick up, what to be executed. And you can sit there and say, OK, compile these to the .o files, then you know, put them together to create this archive. And it's a lot of fun, but it, it removes the need for you to sit there and hand compile each and every class, especially when you have a lot of them, it takes care of the dependencies. So make is an example of a DSL, but what's the domain in this case? The domain in this case is the build, right? If you're a person who does the builds, it takes care of your domain. If you don't have anything to build, maybe the make is looking as an uh, as a, you know, alien syntax. There is also terseness in here, right? It's very terse. Um, and, uh, but also, there's idiosyncrasy involved in it. If you're writing a make file, this better be a tab over here. Otherwise, things don't work properly, right? So there's a tab that intends, but guess what? The tab just communicated something to you. And that you have something that's a target you want to build. There are the things on the, that are dependent on the right side separated by the colon. And then the action you want to take is indented by this tab. And you can have several of those. Look at the terseness of that, right? It's very expressive, right? Of course, if you say, I love make, you need help. That's a different story, right? But within reason, we begin to appreciate the make file. But after that, it kind of becomes annoying too. But that's, a, but that's an example of a DSL. Here's an example of a DSL. This is the good old ant file, right? So ant is a Java equivalent of a make file, right? Uh, so what does ant do? It allows you to specify these targets you want to build and says, well, if I want to compile this code, Here's the source file or source files. Here's the destination directory where I want to put stuff. Here's the dependencies I want to bundle in and so on. You can specify some of these things and you can maintain the ant script and that build.xml is an example of a DSL. So notice now you have been using DSL all along. You just may not have thought about them as a DSL, right? But of course, all these examples are still specific to we the geeks, the programmers, right? Or something related to the software development itself. Now, internal DSLs, what are those? An internal DSL is a DSL which is written in the syntax of a host language. Now, the code you're writing in the DSL is actually a syntax in another language. You don't go to the customers, your users, and tell them that. That's a wrong thing to do, right? Then they, there are two things that could happen, right? They may faint because they don't like to code, and they think they're coding. Or they may get very creative. They say, aha, what if I start using this, all the power of this language? That could also be not a good thing. So you don't ever want to tell them that you're giving them a full-blown language, but the syntax they're going to use is within this language, a host language. Now, what's the good thing about this? Because it's in the syntax of a host language, you don't have to write a parser because the parser is already written for you, right? So you can simply use and write along the parser that is given for you by this language. But what's the bad news? Your syntax is limited to what this language provides for you, right? You sit there and say, I want to use this symbol or I want to put this in this way the language doesn't allow you that. The parser for the language, the grammar for the language doesn't allow you that. You cannot do, go wild and do it, right? So what do you do in that case? Either you accept that it's limiting and move on, or you become very creative. And you find a way very tactfully to say, yeah, 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 but you won't allow me that, but. And there's always this, you know, ways to kind of trick it around, and you see if you can do that. So we'll talk about some of those a little later on and see how we can do that as we look at an example. These are also called as embedded DSLs, and they are built on a host language, like I said, uh, and you can write along that host language and construct your DSLs. So you don't need to write a parser, like I said. You can tactfully map the syntax of your language to the constructs that are already provided by this underlying host language. 
So you can enjoy the flexibility these languages provide you. You're also limited by the idiosyncrasies and limitations of the language as well. Here's an example of a DSL, internal DSL. This is an example of a rake file. A rake file is kind of like a make file, but this is for the Ruby language. So of course it doesn't mean you have to use this only for Ruby. I use this for all kinds of stuff on my machine. I, even though I may not be coding Ruby, I may write a rake task that goes dust stuff on my machine. For example, you know, I'm a person who is extremely lazy. I don't have time to do a lot of things, but I want to back up my computer every night. So guess what? There's a rake task that wakes up in the middle of the night and grabs all the relevant stuff from my machine, bundles it up, and sends it across for you know, backup. So that's a task that is written in Rake. You could say, hey, wait a minute, why couldn't you write this as a script in the operating system? I could have. But the advantage this gives me is that I can take these scripts and I, to a certain extent run it across machines as well. So that gives me a level of indirection. And also it's a lot more fun to write this than anything else. So I may tend to use that for that particular reason. So let's take a look at an example here real quick as just one trivial example here. Um, so I'm going to basically say, um, so, um, ah. okay. So let's uh, give an example here. I want to quickly create a little thing to show you how this can work. So let's say a uh, rake file, um, let's say uh, my task, so task. Actually, rake file is good enough, uh, rake file. So, um, so let's look at this rake, what am I going to do? This is just a dependency I'm going to express. So let me just go ahead and type this here. So I'm going to say, uh, you know, start, right? So, okay, let's say uh, deliver. So deliver what? I'm going to depend on nothing right now. And I could basically say what I want to achieve in this particular case. So I'm going to say this one. Um, oh, so task is going to be what I'm going to create. And the name I'm going to go give is uh, deliver. And let's say it doesn't depend on anything. I could just write it like this. Now I could define what this action is. Let's just say puts deliver for here, right? Now, all this I'm saying is I'm just printing that message. That's all I'm doing. And I could start defining another task. And I could say default. Now, the default ta task is going to depend on a uh, deliver task, right? So just start, start with this little example, right? So not a whole lot I did. So I'm going to just type rake over here, right? And notice it said deliver. What did he do? How does he know to do that, right? Well, it's extremely trivial if you think about it. What it did was, when you typed rake, by default, it looks for a task called default. And it finds the default task. So what's a task? You know, rake is just an application. What this application did was, it first processed this file and looked for all these tasks. And the minute you said a task, it said, oh, what's your name? My name is default. It created a hash map, right? And the hash map, it says, your name is default. I'm going to attach you with a, with a task to execute. Right? And then it said, oh, but you're dependent on deliver. Right? OK, I'm dependent on deliver, so what am I going to do? I'm going to go keep looking for other tasks. Oh, there's a task called deliver. What does it do? Well, that's just this body of code I'm going to execute. OK, put that away. So now he knows how to execute this. You run rake. He goes, looks for this default, found the default, picks up the deliver, goes to deliver, gets the code, and runs it. Right? Now, what's the big deal? The big deal is you can go define this functionality a little bit more. So now I can say, OK, but to deliver something, I've got to do the work first, right? So I'm going to say work, right? Well, what does work mean? So I could say task is going to be work, but work depends on starting the task. But once I start the task, I could say working, right? I'm just kind of setting up a series of dependencies in this case, right? Now, what does the start mean? Task start doesn't depend on anything, and I'm going to say prepare for the task, right? So notice how I'm setting up these dependencies of these. Now if I come back here and do the rake, it says prepare, working, and deliver. And that's a sequence it followed to do this, right? Please. Uh, does it have anything to do with the order in which uh, you're defining? Not at all, right? So can you just take the task, start, prepare, and put it down, and you still come along? The that's going to cost you money. <laughs> yes, but yes, absolutely. Why? Because the real dependency here is in 
in that, right? So you want me to move the start down, is that what you're saying? Yeah. So if I move that here and go back and run it, it better be exactly the same, right? Or did it change? It changed. <laughs> ah, wait a minute. You know what? Deliver works on work. Work depends on start. Hee <laughs> um, hee. Uh, you know what? I, I sleep sometimes when I talk. Okay. You're absolutely right. So there's a do. There we go. So I'll make mistakes, by the way. Some intentional, some not. I won't tell you which one is which. <laughs> right? So, um, so at this point, you seem to be the only person awake in the room. Um, did it do it? Yeah. There you go. Cool. So the order doesn't depend, right? So it is independent of the order right there. But look at this for a second. Would you agree that this is simple? It is insanely simple, right? When Jim Wyrick created this, you look at this and you almost cry. It's like, my goodness, that's trivial. Why didn't I think about it, right? That's how simple that is, right? It's pretty simple. Please. Uh, because you don't have to stay insane after you type it. That's the difference, right? Because it's pretty simple, but hang on. I could write Ruby, Ruby code here. I could, so you say, hey, how do we do this? Oh, uh, we don't know. Okay, I can write a Ruby function, and I can come and call it here, right? So in the example I gave you, I want to go call into subversion, which is my repository, where I put my stuff, right? So I would write my rake file, where it first issues command to subversion, say, go dump all these for me. And subversion does a dump. Then I say, OK, now do the backup for me. But it gives me the ability to write these code. I'm not restricted with what make. Because make is an external DSL, I'm constrained by that. In this case, I can extend this further, right? I'm not limited by the commands of rake. I can add more commands to it. It's easier. But also, um, did you have a question or comment here? <laughs> Uh, so the question is, did it give me too much power? Well, guess what? This is the domain of a computer professional, right? You, the more power you have is to maintain your system. So in this case, the answer is yes, but that's to your advantage. But having said that, if I write a rake file with 100 lines here, I should be shot, right? That's poor practice anyways. So that, again, I would apply my discipline as a computer professional in writing it properly. And so all the other things will come in too, but you write. But in this case, that's actually your advantage, not your disadvantage, right? Now, if you think about it this way, but look at this for a second, right? Deliver depends on work. I didn't have to tell you that, right? You already knew that when you looked at it. Why? Because that arrow kind of says, hey, look, that's a dependency. Right? You didn't look at that and say, what would that mean? Probably you said, well, is it what I think it is? It's pretty intuitive. But if you really think about this, you know what task is? Task is a function. And that function is taking a parameter. What's the parameter it's taking? It's taking a hash map. In Ruby syntax, a hash map has key and value, and the value is separated from the key using the arrow. So this literally used pure Ruby syntax. It was nothing more, nothing less. And so this is purely Ruby code. There is nothing more to it in this particular case. That's the beauty of the internal DSL, is that it fit in very, and look at the, look at the um, tactfulness here, right? The syntax of the language nicely fell in place to indicate this dependency in this particular case. Sorry, yes. So would you say that uh, task and put as both are part of the DSL? Or would you say that task is part of the DSL? The, the, this is the DSL syntax itself. So if you define the jargon, the vocabulary, task is part of the jargon or vocabulary, yeah. right? It's because I'm defining tasks that I implement. There are names for the task, and there are things that it depends on. So the task is part of your vocabulary. Okay. 
Oh, it will not, right? Because the minute you deviate, kind of goes back to his question, the minute you deviate, and somebody whose domain is this, and they cannot make sense out of it, then it wouldn't be. Uh, well, but, but the goal is that as a domain expert, I'm going to confine within my domain, right? And if it makes sense to me in that domain, it's kind of like you, you, you're going to work within the vocabulary that you are familiar with. So going outside of this is purely your choice. You don't have to do it, right? And most likely you won't do it, right? So you're not going to use something that doesn't make sense to you and you will confine to it. If you say, well, what if I want, you want me to limit me from doing it? That's a different story. You can take care of that by writing other things. But that's also one of the disadvantages that you will see in an internal DSL. It, Which is part of? The vocabulary of this DSL, of the DSL. Uh-huh. The task, the task you're saying? Yes. yes, it is. No, no, the puts, the puts is not. The puts is not. It's not. No, but, but hang on though. Yeah. But hang on though. It's not part of the vocabulary, but it's part of the action. Because what do you do in the action? Well, that's up to me, right? I may do a copy. I may print something. I may delete a file. That's my action. So elements basically are indicative of symbols in Ruby. So, but that's more expressive because it gives me an illusion that I've defined a certain something superior, but it's nothing but a string at the end of the day, right? Actually, it's a symbol, but you know, we won't go into that detail here. Let's kind of interchangeably think about them as strings and symbols together. Oh, you could talk about JSP as a DSL, maybe an ugly DSL, but yes, I'm just kidding. Yeah, absolutely. Uh -huh. Question is, uh, if I am familiar with Java, uh, used in for a long time and quite ha you know, comfortable with it in terms of having used it, isn't it something a little bit new for me to use? Um, well, certainly a person using Ant most likely may not use Rake because this is a Ruby thing and not a Java thing. But you could use this in JRuby, right? But the question is, why should I do something else when this has been something I've learned along the way that's because that you, you, you see a, a need for more productive gains, right? You could say, wait a minute, I could be enduring this XML syntax, or this is a lot more expressive, right? I mean, I've done uh, Ant for quite a while. When I came across this, I said, you know what, I don't need to deal with that clutter and complexity. I can go off and do this much more easily. And there's also equivalence in the Java community where you can build on top of Ant itself. So you don't have to use Ray. But there's something else we'll talk about in a few minutes. But there is some new learning. That oh, I, I hope that is the case, right? Because you want to constantly learn so you're more productive. Here's an example, right? I've been riding a bicycle for 20 years. Hey, you know what? I have taken the time to injure my knee several times on the bicycle. I can ride a bicycle really well. Shouldn't I be happy with it, right? You know what? To the learning to drive is a lot of effort. And if you're not learned driving by the time you're 20 years, it's even bigger effort. So I, that's the same thing. Should I take the time to learn a, driving a car, or should I just be happy with my bicycle? Well, I'll tell you what, I actually ride my bicycle today, but I also drive my car. Because a bicycle is going to only take me that much distance, but I've got to cover greater distance in smaller time, and a bicycle is not going to do that for me. So it gives me a lot more productivity, right? But then I don't just use my car for everything, right? To come here, there's absolutely no way I could have taken a car to come here, right? So I've got to take an airplane to come here. So you've got to use a tool for the right job. Otherwise, we're not going to be able to progress further, right? So yes, there is a curve, a learning curve. Just like I took time to you know, drive cars after several years of just riding a bicycle, right? But that's the cost versus benefit. And yes, it was a pain to learn it. But the benefit has outweighed the cost in, in great proportions. That's exactly what we need to, you need to be able to justify that to yourself. And, and, and having said that, honestly, I would say it's a lot of time. That's what keeps me on my job. Imagine you wake up in the morning and you say, I'm going to go back and write the same stupid code again today. I fall back and sleep for another two hours. But I wake up and say, you know what, I'm going to learn something different today. That excites me and I want to go do it because that motivates me to you know, go do, try new things. And, and you can get better, and that is actually a very good thing, right? Yes. All right, so, so we based, uh, please. Sorry, uh, it was, uh, let me uh, inform uh, for my ignorance to mm -hmm. from what you were talking uh, so far. What I could gather is, uh, tell me from now, uh, let's say, you know, I'm a domain specific person. Mm -hmm. I'm, let's say, a mathematician. Right. And, uh, you know, I, I just know, I know 
Not that you need to know about it as a mathematician, right? That's the knowledge that I have as a person creating it, not a knowledge I translate to you. You as a domain user should not be concerned. In fact, it is an unnecessary concern I put on you by telling you, oh, by the way, this is in Ruby. That's a totally unnecessary information for you, right? You're a domain expert, the mathematician, and I come to you and say, okay, here is a tool I'm giving you. Here are vocabulary, here's how you do stuff. End of story. Okay, so uh, let's say, I mean, it's, it's almost like uh, uh, you, uh, I mean, you just provide me something, you provide me interfaces. Right, a vocabulary, a set of keywords and okay. commands, that's what I've given you. Okay. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. So, uh, beginner, how can we learn to do programming in DSL? Or learn DSL? Uh, no, you actually won't have to spend much time learning it at all because it is already in the vocabulary of your domain. Yes, you do have to learn a little bit. But if you come to me and say, but I don't really have a clue what a task means, well, it's not your domain. You see what I'm saying? If this is for a person who understands the domain, right? You go to somebody and say, here's a tool to cut wood. And he says, nice, but what's a wood? You say, never mind, right? Because it's the domain, this is the carpenter, he cuts wood every day. You tell him, here's a tool to cut wood better. Well, you're learning the, the syntax of the language being provided to you in the terminology and the jargon you already are familiar with. Yeah. So you are coming with not a beginner, you're coming with the expertise of the domain. And you're learning the nuances of this particular syntax. And you, a lot of times, you actually influence this by saying, look, this is what I do for a living. Give me something that's usable for me. Just like you develop a user interface, a classical user interface, you can provide one that's clunky and totally useless, or you can provide something user friendly. Same thing with the DSL, right? You want to provide something that they are comfortable and productive using. And your job as a programmer is to know what that is, to learn what that is, and develop that one. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, so now we're taking this example away from a uh, main file or an Android. Right. From, from the domain of you know, building right, right. Uh, project. Sure. Uh, something, you know, in real life, something that you, you get to a client who is not, who's un unaware of. S sure, that's a very good question, right? So her question is hey, you know what, let's get out of this computer domain, right? Tell me something I could do with this outside of. Programmer activity, build activity. I'll give you two examples, right? One example is uh, uh, th these guys, if you go to their website and read about it all day long, you will never see the word DSL. And I think that's a good thing, right? Uh, but it's called Cactus. Cactus is a tool that allows physicists to model their, their you know, physics computations across a network of processors. So you could say, OK, here is a little you know, computation of some equation, whatever it is, but it's so complex, you cannot just do it on one machine. So they would sit there and say, I want to distribute these across these machines for computation and go execute this mathematical model. Oh, by the way, this model requires the third party libraries. Go do it. That's one. You could say, OK, Venka, that's great, but that still involves these distribution and processors. Can we go away from it, right? Another example is, uh, a, a company that has done, uh, that's in the line of uh, insurance business, right? In the case of insurance, you have actuaries whose job is to describe rules around the risk in insurance, right? If I call and say, hey, I want to get insured, but I'm 97 years old, right? And they're going to say, oh, you're a high risk, right? So maybe we don't want to insure you. Or, yeah, we'll insure you, but you've got to pay us $10 million, whatever that is, right? So these guys write these rules. And in fact, this was written in Groovy. And I was talking to the guy who was working on this project. He said, oh, these guys are using Groovy. These guys, I know, I kind of little got a little anxious. I sat with him and said, don't tell me that your insurance actuaries 
really are GUI programmers. That bothers me, right? And he said, oh, okay, I've got to clarify this. We have written this DSL for them in Groovy. No, they don't know that they are using Groovy. I said, okay, now we are in good terms, right? So this is purely a rule, set of rules they have provided for these actuaries. So when these actuaries come down and sit down in front of their computer, they are sitting there and defining the risk factor for insurance. And they say, here's the type of you know, condition the patient has. Here's the kind of situations that are around it. Here are the laws depending on the state in which they live. Right? There are certain states where there are some strict rules. You cannot, uh, you know, you cannot uh, deny insurance for a patient because of a certain condition, but you may have an opportunity to charge them more, for example. Right? Whereas in other states, you can outright reject them. Right? But these are rules. And they sit there and express these kinds of rules, and then the application then picks that up and executes it. But these are rules that change extremely often. So that's an example, right? So right there, they can sit there and manipulate these and have the power to manipulate, but it's extremely expressive because it's their domain. That's what they do for a living, but it has given them the power. Instead of saying, I'll write a Word document, give that to you as a programmer, and you then go program it. And then we come back and see if it works, it's a way for them to directly express it, right? You might much, much rather just sit there and change it and say, okay, now we are done. You eliminated the programmer from the loop, and that's a good thing. So the programmer can do something more useful than sitting and maintaining that code with the rule change every day. No, it is not, right, because that's a general purpose language. Well, but no, but your domain is not a programming domain because you're using that to implement something else, right? It's a tool itself that you use to build other things. So that would be too broad of a definition to call that as a DSL. What if the domain was computing? Uh, even then, it's too broad because it doesn't, it doesn't channelize you into doing something specific, right? You want it to be... Mm -hmm. No, it's, again, it's got to be narrow and specific, right? If you make it too broad, it becomes pretty ineffective. That's where you need to draw the line, otherwise it leads to confusion and chaos. Uh -huh. Can metadata be defined as, uh, as a DSL, for example? That's a good question, right? It, again, it depends on how you look at things. To a certain extent, yes, they can, and we're going to see a few examples of that you know, very soon. And so, yes, in fact, when I was learning Ruby, I was complaining that Ruby doesn't have annotations. And then I realized how stupid I was in making that claim because Ruby is built up with annotation completely from the ground up. Because in, in Ruby, when you say private, when you say public, those really are functions you are calling. So it's like annotating a lot of these features. So yeah, it gives you that power. So you could say metadata or annotations could be considered as a DSL, but they don't become DSL because they are metadata. They become DSLs because you apply that within the context of something where you're expressing. That's where the DSL emerges out of that. Let me qualify that metadata a little bit. Let's say that there's a thing ML. There used to be that XML variant earlier in the thing. But right. For a domain specific, we had an XML. Sure. Which, uh, so, which ML? Absolutely, yeah. A lot of it. So when you write a file in that, would you call that? Because that is specific. It is, right? So XML, if I give you an XML with a certain domain aspect of things to express, let's say, engineering data, or, or uh, HL7, which is the uh, medical data, those are all DSLs. They're external DSLs, but nevertheless, they're DSLs, right? Absolutely. Let me continue a little bit further. I definitely want to answer more questions, but I want to cover some grounds too, but we'll come back and pick it up, okay? So let's go back, uh, and uh, so we looked at an example of a DSL here. Let's continue further. Um, so here's another example. This is Gantt. So you were asking earlier, hey, look, I'm using Ant. What do I do? You could use a Gantt, right? Gantt is an example. It's a wrapper, actually, around Ant. So rather than using XML, you can use a syntax like this. This is actually written in Groovy, right? So it's a Groovy implementation, but it's a wrapper around Ant. So this is translated to Ant, and then it works under the hood. Russell Winder uh, basically uh, uh, wrote this, uh, and he's evolving this as we speak. So that's basically where you say target, and you say what the target is, and then you specify a name for the target, 
And then you say, instead of the do and the end, you have the curly brackets because they're closures in Ruby, and you see it right there. That's an example of Gantt, which is a wrapper around ant. So if you're saying, look, I'm comfortable, I know what ant is, you don't have to depart from it. But you don't have to, unless you say, Venkat, I feel really depressed. If I don't write XML, then you want to stay with ant. Right? If you say, look, I'm depressed with XML, then you can come back and use it, but you don't have to throw everything you know already. I have this question uh, related to whatever question you were asking. Mm -hmm. We had an application which generated text files, mm -hmm. invoices, basically the output of invoices as a text file. So right. It was like export. Sure. The accounting packages used to import this. So it's like sure. some of DSL. Right. So there is uh, something like DSL, uh, which is uh, understood between Right. So, so it's a data input file that is very specific to that particular domain, and people who are using it are able to deal with it. Right? That's basically what it is. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So we talked about this. Let me show you one more example here. This is something that I've been excited for uh, a, a little bit more recently. Uh, this is a tool uh, called ECB. So this is a tool that was created by... Um, by um, Andy Glover, and what ECB does is, it is based on similar concept like, uh, like our spec. This is a way for you to express your application details, your user stories, so your customers can tell you what these user stories are, you can evolve this with them, but at the end of the day, you're creating what's called an executable documentation. So you're creating an executable documentation where you're saying, look, if this is the doc you created, I'm gonna then run this across my system and ascertain that my system is behaving like you're described over here, right? So I'll give you an example of this, very trivial example I'll give you here, but the, well, the reason I like EZB is the pure expressiveness, right? That's what is really interesting in this case. So let's say I'm gonna create deposit uh, money uh, dot story, right? So let's say what deposit money dot story is gonna look like, right? This is a blank file I created, right? All that it is is depositmoney.story. Notice that the, the name of the file is deposit money. The extension is story. Do you know what language this is? It's in the EZB language, right? It's the domain of the customer specifying the user story. That's the whole idea, right? So now I'm going to say, you know, scenario, and I'm going to specify deposit money, right? So then what I'm going to do here is simply say given... Uh, you know, account, let's say one, two, three, four, five, uh, you know, when deposit $50, then balance goes up by 50, right? So if you notice this, that is a spec right there, right? It's extremely lightweight, isn't it? Who can write it? Anybody who knows typing can write it, right? It is not, it is not something that's complicated. You don't have to spend too much time learning. There's a couple of words you have to learn. That's how lightweight this is. But what you just did was you just created a document that could actually be executed. So now I can go back to the command line and I could say, you know, EZB, which is an alias I created to, to a Java program behind the scene, and I'm going to say deposit money story. And it says running deposit money story, scenario ran is one, no failures, but one is pending because I did not tie this to my underlying system yet. Right? So it says I executed this as one is pending and whatever time it took to run it. Now I can go write other scenarios, right? I can say deposit $500,000, right? And then there are rules that are related to depositing large sum of money, right? And so you write those things as a description. Now